Welcome to Risk Roundup. The power grid, perhaps the largest machine on earth, which was built after World War II using technology that is perhaps century old and connected through power lines in total of millions of miles is serving not only millions of homes globally, but also entities across nations, its governments, industries, organizations, and academia. So while the grid is mostly able to meet the growing power demand across nations, it seems that it is in dire need of technology transformation and evolution to become more resilient, reliable, efficient, stable, smart, and more secure to be fit for the digital global age. Now, there are strong indicators that using information, communication, and digitization technologies, the grid has begun to enhance functionality and communication between turbines and boilers and generators, high voltage transmission lines and electricity distribution systems. And it, the internet of things is also enabling instantaneous safety alerts, streamlining SCADA management and automating load balancing. So as the grid goes through technology triggered digital transformation and is on its way becoming smart, it is also proving to be quite fragile and vulnerable and is facing complex security challenges, not only from cyberspace, but also geospace and space. As a result, with each day passing, the security threats facing grid is increasing in frequency and strength. So as the efforts to digitize and modernize the century old grid intensifies, it is important to understand and evaluate the technology and process changes, its impact, strength, weaknesses, and discuss what needs to be done to protect the grid. To discuss smart grid further, I'm delighted to welcome Michael Hopkins to Risk Roundup. Michael is the CEO of ICE Energy and is based in the United States. Welcome, Michael. We are honored to have you on Risk Roundup. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Wonderful, Michael. So technology transformation is changing everything. Amidst that, how would you describe today's electric power grid across nations? Well, it's a fascinating topic when you talk about technology change, because technology change, as you well know, and as I'm sure your listeners and viewers know, we're seeing radical fundamental change happen quickly in a variety of industries where you've had something being done one way for decades or even centuries. And within the space of a very short period of time, maybe that industry doesn't even exist anymore or you wouldn't even recognize it. And I thought you described very accurately the grid we have today and the grid that pretty much everyone, at least in the developed world has, which is a grid that is very old. It is uh, fossil fuel based. Uh, it is central plant designed so that the whole idea of pretty much any grid you wanna look at anywhere in the world is that you're gonna have large fossil fuel power plants. Those are going to be turned up and down as demand changes. You're going to have large transmission facilities to get the power from these large power plants, which obviously are not in urban areas, they are outside. You get the transmitted in, then you've got to have them distribute it, the power distributed from the transmission with substations and feeders to get to the point of consumption. And there's, I'd say in that current state, there's some inherent vulnerabilities. And I'm talking before we get into uh, technological change and before we get into a smart grid, just um, physically, that is an inherently vulnerable system. If your delivery system is all central based, a central plant model, it is vulnerable and it has been vulnerable to uh, just physical attack, not cyber attack, just physical attack. And something that I think has been of concern for a long time with grid operators and grid planners and with uh, Homeland Security is that uh, it has always been relatively easy to do a tremendous amount of damage to the grid. And if you think of doing damage to the grid, it's obvious the kind of damage you're doing to a country and to a community, to an economy. If you're disrupting the supply of electricity, given everything that uses electricity, 
the damage is tremendous. So I'd start by saying the grid that we have today has this inherent physical vulnerability. An example just being a, a, a person, a guy with a gun shooting at a transformer in the right place, which often is out in the middle of nowhere, can do significant damage. If you coordinate that, uh, you can do a lot of damage. So it's just inherently, I'd say, vulnerable. Without getting into anything uh, creative or anything elaborate or anything having to do with technology, the grid today has this vulnerability. So. Yeah. Right, and I think you gave it an excellent example about how easy it is for someone to uh, cause that damage. And I think that kind of incident has already happened probably somewhere in California. And you made another excellent point about the centralization of the electricity generation. And I think that's where the biggest problem is because you you target the centralized you know electric generation facility and you can bring the country or you know the community uh, on a hold you know there is nothing that we will be able to do because replacing that is so difficult to re uh, fix it is so difficult so please continue no i i think you made an excellent point there about the centralization well thank you so so you, you've got that that centralized plant you've got that physical vulnerability then if i turn to what you were talking about which is Technologically, the grid has been changing. They've been going from, call it a, a dumb grid that's mostly kind of mechanical to a smart grid where they've introduced um, uh, in, in a lot of places, and it's uh, certainly going to continue, smart metering. Uh, and then everything that comes with smart metering so that there is a coordination of everything electronically and an ability to know, which they didn't know previously, who's consuming what, when, where, how do we get the electricity, how do we best coordinate this? and on the one hand, that's an enabling technology. That, that's, you can say that's a good thing. That's, that's making the, the whole grid smarter. Therefore, it can be more efficient. Therefore, it can be a better run. However, I'd say, again, there's this inherent vulnerability that if you have a system that's physically vulnerable and then you overlay electronic controls and monitoring over everything and it's web-based, then you have exposed a whole new area of targeting, which is not the guy with the gun, but it's the hacker. And there can be a whole range of sophistication, which I think you're much closer than I would be, as to what people can do when you've got something that is a network system, whether it's just some kid fooling around or whether it's a real coordinated serious attack. And that's something that I think, again, the same grid operators, um, same policymakers, that have been concerned pretty much forever about the physical vulnerability of this central plan obviously have the same kind of concerns. And I think it's, I don't think, I know it's an area of tremendous investment uh, in terms of protecting cybersecurity. Uh, it hasn't been a, a, an area of tremendous investment about the physical facility and the physical plant because unfortunately it, that kind of is what it is. Unless you, radically redesign and change the electricity grid, you're just stuck with that physical vulnerability. So I think what people have been really addressing is, well, what can you do to prevent cyber attacks or mitigate them, contain them? Now, the other trend, which I think, because this has been kind of a downer, <laughs> the other trend that I think should make people optimistic is uh, increasingly in many parts of the grid, and I'd say the extreme case would be Hawaii, but California would be a case where it's very clear. We're seeing a pretty fast move away from um, fossil fuel generation to renewable generation. Hawaii, for some obvious reasons, has sort of gone almost the whole way to renewable. California, for policy reasons, is been moving quite quickly. But you're seeing it, I'd say, in many parts of the United States and certainly in many parts of the world where um, because, not really because of policy anymore, but because the cost of solar and the cost of wind has come down so far that it's becoming a popular and sometimes first choice just based on cost for new generation. And with that transition away from fossil fuels to renewables, and I'm I'm certainly not saying there's a move generally from fossil fuels to renewables because this is limited to the electricity market. There'll always be a need for fossil fuels for all kinds of other purposes. 
But I do think that over a relatively short period of time, we're going to see, and we're seeing it right now, this um, move. Most new generation in the United States is renewable, not fossil fuel based. And with that change in generation is coming a change in the grid. Um, renewables are not mostly centralized. They're mostly actually distributed. Uh, home solar PV being the most obvious example. And it's also a technology that's become just a good investment really for anybody, uh, at least in a number of jurisdictions, California, Hawaii, the whole New England states, Arizona, Nevada. And I think as costs keep coming down, that just becomes more and more popular where it's just the thing to do. Now, as you get all of this local generation, and then the other thing that's happening is uh, they're getting local energy storage. You know, it used to be no one except whatever, a mountain man would have at their home, you know, a whole bunch of batteries and some solar and wind and basically live a life where you okay during the day, but you probably pretty much have to shut down when the sun goes down. We now have technologies, and I mean like right today, where uh, I personally, if I would like, can simply uh, replace the grid, replace the utility. I can disconnect with a combination of solar PV, uh, very affordable batteries that allow me to do just what I like to do anytime I want to do it, including all through the night. And that's actually happening in Australia where you're seeing large numbers of people that are um, people that live in cities and uh, middle or upper class with, with a, a, an unwillingness to kind of make any kind of sacrifice. They are disconnecting to the grid. They are becoming completely independent of the grid. And all of this is just to say that I believe that technology, specifically renewable and energy storage technologies, are driving a trend towards complete independence, if it's desired, at any building, at any home, where being connected to the grid becomes a choice rather than a necessity. And the big positive from my perspective, and I think from a security perspective, is as you distribute generation, and as generation becomes located more at the point of consumption than far away, requiring the transmission, requiring the substation, requiring the feeders, the grid actually just gets transformed from this central vulnerable model to more of a mesh network that's there if you want to participate and if you want to trade energy with other people. But if you choose not to, or if you come to believe that's vulnerable, or if the grid is not operating, you'll be able to just say, it's not operating. I'm gonna just flip a switch at your home, disconnect, and I'm good. I'm just, I'm still getting power. In that environment, the, the risk issues are fundamentally improved. Uh, whether you're talking about a physical uh, threat, uh, or whether that's man-made or it's natural. Um, you know, if, if there's a giant storm that devastates an area, well, it easily could destroy a power plant and therefore affect hundreds of thousands of people. It's highly unlikely though to destroy hundreds of thousands of home PV. <laughs> it just is unlikely to do that. Um, so the impact of problems is going to be much more localized and isn't going to just spread the way it kind of of necessity spreads today. Sure. No, I, so I, I, all that said, I'm, more, I'm much more optimistic Yes. about the security situation of the grid just because uh, there's a change happening. Mm -hmm. And I think we're just talking about how fast it's going to happen. But the faster it happens and the, the more complete the change, the better we're all going to be. There's still going to be these physical issues. There's still going to be these cyber issues. But the impact of a problem is going to be much more contained. Sure, no, I, I, I think you gave an excellent background and you talked about uh, several different points like, you know, the grid one is we are going towards the digitization, the information communication and digitization technologies is helping us create a smart grid. And then second, you talked about the distributed energy resources, which is a really good trend that we will be able to use many, you know, different resources like solar and wind. And, you know, we will be able to generate electricity through many, many different uh, resources. And then you talked about, uh, you know, the microgrids 
probably that is uh, you know localized development and the localized islands uh, separated from these you know centralized uh, power generation facilities which you know solves many problems that it moves away from centralization towards decentralization and we will be like you said we'll be able to with the batteries and then we'll be able to trade it and we will be able to be self sufficient each individual each home as well as business will be you know hopefully someday be self sufficient in uh, their energy needs which is a really good trend so when we look at all these developments happening how are all these ongoing technological changes affecting the business operations distribution and the supply model of the power grids participants because uh, it not only we are not talking only about the energy producers but also the end users how is the whole ecosystem changing and evolving because of this technology these three emerging technologies that is driving the change radically the 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 roles of the participants in the electricity grid are radically changing i'd start with the uh, traditional big player of the grid is the utility the the company that owns the, the grid and operates the grid that business which has been i'd say kind of pretty constant and unchanging for a long long time has basically been a, a monopoly where they have a, a necessity that nobody else in the area can have. They're regulated, but so they're a regulated monopoly. And their business has been to simply make sure that that grid operates and to invest their shareholders' money in the physical grid. That's how they make their money. They don't actually make money by selling electricity. They get a regulated rate of return based on how much money they've invested in the physical infrastructure. So they actually have had two incentives, two different incentives to uh, build more and more of this centralized grid. One is um, their, their real job is keep the grid operating. So one way to do that is just overbuild it like crazy. And that mitigates, minimizes the risk of disruption. The other incentive is that's how they make their money. Their shareholders make money by how much capital has been invested in this physical grid. So that's been the business of utilities. And I'd say it's, it's, I'm not saying that's easy to keep a grid always operating, but it's a pretty basic, simple business model. I own this system. No one else is allowed to own this or to sell what I sell. And my job is to just make sure that electricity is delivered when needed and it doesn't go down. And within reason, the more money I spend on it, the better. Uh, that's how I make my money. Now, in the current environment, that has definitely changed. There are, I'd say, a few jurisdictions where that's still kind of the case. But overwhelmingly in the United States, the way things have gone now is that regulators and policymakers have said, yeah, that's, that's not the way it is anymore. We want you to stop building traditional grid. We want you to focus on demand side management. We don't want you just incentivized to build facilities. We want to put in regulations that um, incentivize you to come up with more creative solutions. And I said, be more focused on the fact that the world is changing and we don't need to keep building big power plants. We need to make better use of the resources we have. And on top of that, yes, we need to integrate these renewables and these renewables are different, fundamentally different than what we had before. And I would say it's going even much further than that. Uh, it's going further from, you know, we're changing the way we regulate you. I can tell you for a fact that there are many utilities, and I'd say pretty much all sophisticated utilities, that realize what we were talking about earlier, that it's not just, uh, you know, changing policies they need to be concerned about. They need to be concerned about that their customers, that they viewed as captive, are no longer captive um, and many of their customers and they'll get to be a point where all of their customers are going to be free to use their service or not use their service and that is i think uh, driving utilities that are thinking about this to understand that they've got to change their business model 
not just because regulators are telling them that they have to behave differently, not just because governments are saying they want to be, you know, more uh, inclusive of renewables. They need to change their bottles because some of their best customers and eventually all their customers will be able to just say, I'm not, not interested in your service anymore. I have my own solar. I've got my own battery storage and it's roughly the same cost, maybe even cheaper. And I just don't need to bother with you anymore. So if you, if you imagine yourself in that position of, one minute you're a monopoly, the next you're not a monopoly and your competitors are all your customers. All your customers have actually become your competitors. Then you gotta, you just need to rethink, right? So you think that the customers are forcing this change on the utilities? If you look at Hawaii and you look at Australia, I'd say those are the first two examples where utility customers are leaving. I'm not saying all of them are, because that's certainly not the case, but significant and increasing numbers of utility customers are disconnecting from the grid. And that is, I think, showing utilities that it's actually happening. Uh, it's more a question in my mind of how quickly it's gonna happen, not a question of, is it gonna happen? Absolutely, it's going to be the case that any homeowner anywhere will be able to economically disconnect from the grid. It's just a question of when is that going to happen? Therefore, I think utilities need to do what, um, well, what they're doing in New York, as an example, which is they are uh, seriously, this is called the, the New York Rev, where they're explicitly talking about the need right now to rethink what's a utility. And in the case of New York Rev, they're doing, they're at least discussing uh, I think in a very serious way, what, what we touched on earlier, which is the utility is not going to be a monopoly. The utility is going to have customers that can leave. And the utility needs to think, well, what, what do I do with this grid? What do I do with this infrastructure? There's literally billions of dollars invested in it. And one, I'd say, obvious transformation that a utility can go through is to think of themselves as I'm a now a service provider and I have a infrastructure that's optional for customers, not necessary anymore. So I need to think about how to make myself valuable. I am not making myself valuable by just telling people, this is the price of electricity. Do you want it or not? Because then they might just leave. You need to start thinking about what we touched on earlier, which is, well, maybe a utility with all this infrastructure can just say, look, I know you can leave my system. I know you can get solar PV. I know you can get battery storage. And if you do that, I can provide you a service. How about I take excess electricity that you don't need and I'll trade it on your behalf. I'll charge you something. Uh, if you're ever short of electricity, which, you know, maybe they are gonna be short, I'll be your backup. And you treat these formerly captive customers as people that you need to keep happy. You know, you, you have to think of yourself like a, uh, whatever, uh, an internet service provider where there's a lot of them out there and it doesn't work to just think you're going to dictate prices. So that's a change going on with utilities. I think if I jump from utilities to the other side, which is the consumer, uh, obviously the consumer's role is changing. And I think that um, you may be able to just say, I don't want to pay attention to any of this. I will just be a utility customer and they'll tell me the price. But when all your neighbors are all getting solar PV and they're all getting their power wall or whatever type of storage they've got or our storage system uh, using ice for cooling, then uh, I think just inevitably, consumers are going to become empowered and they're going to be the so-called prosumers where they're not just there buying electricity at whatever price they're told to buy it at, they're thinking that uh, uh, electricity is something that I, I manage and I might even make money from. Uh, it may be a profit center for me, depending upon what kind of systems I have in place. And that is definitely an area where we've gone technologically from, uh, you know, at the home, a, 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 a dumb thermostat to the nest. And I, you're, you're gonna see, you're basically gonna be seeing some version of what you have in commercial buildings now, where you have a smart energy management system in the home, it's likely gonna be one that just operates off your phone. Sorry. Yes. One, that just one that just operates off of your phone. And 
people will be in the business if they want to be of making money off of their energy and not losing money off of their energy. And then there's a whole other business that's going to emerge. And there's some of them, but not so many. And that's energy service providers and aggregators that are going to want to come in and say, hey, homeowner, I know you can do all that stuff yourself, but how about I just manage it all for you? And their business is going to be to aggregate thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of homes or businesses and become major traders of energy. And they'll do it all for you. And they might just say to you, hey, um, yeah, you can do all that stuff. If you, you can buy from the utility if you want. You can just do it all yourself. Or how about I just charge you 100 bucks a month for all your energy you need and you don't do anything. Don't worry about solar. If I think you need solar, I'll pay for it and I'll put it on. Um, where everything is, becomes a service. And that's another thing that I can tell you, I see that happening, that businesses are seeing this is an opportunity. And that's another reason why utilities have got to move really quickly, because there are people that can come in and basically take their business and don't really need their infrastructure. Yes, definitely. You know, I, I, I see those uh, signs too, but at the same time, uh, these uh, still, it, it is at a local level. You know, it is still, you don't see that as a major trend. It is going towards that, but it is still, you know, probably years away the, where we will be able to see everything decentralized. So uh, when we talk at a national level, if nations are conceptualizing what should be the future design of the uh, power grid system, you know, is do you see that all nations are kind of following the same trend or you see different nations, you know, depending on their uh, different necessities that they are, you know, coming up with a different design of the uh, power grid that makes sense for their, you know, customers, for their needs. So because for any nation, the grid is a very large and expensive system. So understandably, it will have many different variables uh, that impacts whether you know what kind of digitization effort, what kind of modernization effort uh, will you know go forward. I mean, it's not only the cost that is here at play, but uh, how, what is the physical wear and tear, or uh, is the technology obsolescence already happening with the technology that uh, their grid has, or what kind of safety, security, sustainability issues that are there, and how their nation's grids at any level, local and, you know, or national, is meeting the power need of the, you know, consumers or citizens. So there are so many different variables, but like you said, you know, we do see sign that, you know, the consumers are driving those uh, uh, demand that the utilities need to change and that the, how the uh, localized, you know, decentralized uh, power system is emerging kind of like microgrids. And mm -hmm. uh, so those changes I do see, but what is, what is the time frame that we can look at when, you know, we will see these changes more prevalent fashion? Well, if we're talking about changes that are truly driven by consumers, I'd say, you know, the, the trends are emerging, but it's not really driving immediate change. Uh, I agree with you. That is probably over the course of several years that things will be truly consumer driven and you'll get to the point where large numbers of consumers are able to be independent of the current grid and therefore of necessity, the grid must change. But as we speak, and actually this has been going on, I'd say for at least the last couple of years, there are fundamental changes going on in the grid uh, driven by renewables. Uh, which have got into, as you touched on, obsolescence. So we have coal plants shutting down. Now, we previously did have coal plants shutting down in certain jurisdictions in the United States, which I would say were policy-driven, where policymakers did not like the environmental impacts of coal, and notwithstanding that at that time, the cost of coal electricity was lower than the cost of other electricity. The policymakers taking account of the environmental impacts were saying, we just don't want it. So that resulted in some shutdowns. Now we're having shutdowns of coal plants, not actually for environmental reasons. We're having shutdowns of coal plants because it's become more expensive than renewable energy and more expensive than natural gas fired generation. So even uh, in the, with the current administration 
that was explicitly coal friendly, uh, at least during the election campaign. The reality has been we're seeing shutdowns of coal plants for purely economic reasons that coal plant operators are not able to compete price-wise against natural gas fired plants and against renewables. I would predict that there's a, not a certainty, but a probability that again, environmental impacts aside, you're going to see solar and wind start to make natural gas fired plants not competitive. Again, there's a lot of things that need natural gas other than electricity. But when it comes to the generation of electricity, I think it is a reasonable projection that no fossil fuel based electricity will be price competitive with renewable energy over time. So these are changes that are just happening. You know, to your question about different countries, I, I, I would say yes, different countries are definitely dealing with this in different ways. And you have countries that I'd say are just going on business as usual, like nothing that we've talked about is really happening or going to happen. They're building large new power plants. They're building large coal plants. They're doing things that I, I would predict will end up looking like stranded assets in the you know well before their useful life. Um, you've got countries that are very much uh, in favor of nuclear. Um, you've got, I think, a, a full range. Generally speaking, if we're just talking about the United States, though, and the multiple different grids in the United States and the different jurisdictions, each, each state is different. I, I think there is a fairly consistent trend uh, that change is needed. There's going to be more renewables, not less. The grid is going to become less centralized, more decentralized, and that those changes should happen. I think that the brightest spot worldwide, the brightest spot is going to be the uh, underdeveloped world, the developing world, where they don't even, in some places, have an electricity grid, or if they have an electricity grid, it's extremely poor. They literally couldn't afford a traditional electricity grid. So they have something, but very little. And in that case, I think we're seeing today, and this I think we'll see a lot more of, is that renewable energy and a much skinny down distributed grid bid, built around renewable energy in underdeveloped and developing countries is going to give those countries an opportunity to actually have a better grid than we do because they're not dealing with all this infrastructure that was built for another time. They're able to do, I think the best analogy would be um, Brazil, where however long ago that was, they, they had a really terrible traditional telecommunication system. So they didn't have no telecommunication system, but they had a notoriously poor one they didn't have the money to really invest in it. So it was very skeletal, very poor. And they saw cell technology, cell phone technology, cellular as an amazing opportunity to just basically say, okay, let's forget about that traditional telecommunication system, which barely worked. And we're never realistically gonna afford a North American style one. So they invested in cellular in the early days of cellular. And they ended up with, at least for a long time, the world's best cellular community because everybody used it. Literally everybody in the country used it. They abandoned the, the, the traditional telecommunication system and went to cellular. I think there's that opportunity today, like right now, for any developing country to say, forget the traditional grid. Let's just invest in bit by bit because it lends itself to that building out a grid uh, in, in pieces that's modular and distributed that's all built around wind and solar and energy storage that goes with it. And, you know, it's affordable at whatever level you can do. If you can do that nationwide, that's great. But, you know, if your starting point is kind of nothing, then anything you do is positive and you're building a grid of the future. So when we talk about grid modernization, uh, I, I often say 
we may see more modern grids in the underdeveloped world than we see in the developed world because we're dealing with, we are going to be dealing with billions, well, it's probably trillions of dollars of what I believe to be stranded assets, assets that were built for another time, have plenty of useful life uh, technically, but aren't useful in the new world. Yes, no, I, I think you made an excellent point that we will see more progress and modernization in nations where they don't have any current existing infrastructure. And uh, because it's much easier for them to just, you know, skip the generation and go towards the uh, futuristic trend. But for uh, nations like ours, for us to, you know, make uh, that kind of changes at a national level, it's going to require not only, you know, trillions of dollars of investment, but so much effort because uh, there is, you know, not only technological aspects, but the non-technological improvements, uh, both the technological as well as non-technological improvements in infrastructure will be necessary. So from your assessment, if we talk about United States, or, you know, any North American country or, you know, any Western country that have a well-established, well-developed uh, energy infrastructure, what technological, non-technological improvements in infrastructure would be necessary to reach the stage where we will have a diver uh, diversified, not, I mean, not, not only diversified, but decentralized energy, you know, infrastructure? Well, I think that we have the technologies today to have a decentralized grid based around the concept that buildings and homes have technologies available to them today that make them independent if they want to be. It's more a case of how quickly are they gonna be adopted, not whether they're available or not. So I believe that we are, that technology that's currently available and is just gonna get better, but it's currently available, technology is gonna drive independence of consumers independence of consumers is going to force change to the grid. And to me, the, the issue is not gonna be, well, is the grid gonna change or who's gonna pay for it? It's gonna be forced by the fact that consumers can just leave the grid. And to me, it's kind of right now, I'm looking at one giant stranded asset problem where no, there's gonna be no real value to large power plants that exist today to large transmission lines, to large substations that were all built around this. So we can, as a country, uh, either federally or at the state level, we can kind of drive into that wall and react to, oh my God, uh, you know, millions of consumers are now leaving the grid and we have this grid that has trillions of dollars invested in it and nobody wants it anymore. So is that just the utility shareholders that bear that? Is it the owners of the power plant that bear that? Or do we as a country, do the policymakers look ahead and say, that's coming, so let's, let's be proactive and let's talk about what productive use can we put to this? Because it's harder to put a, make a productive use of all these assets kind of after the fact, as of consumers that have said, yeah, don't want that anymore. I'm going to have my own solar, I'm going to have my own batteries, um, completely independent. I think if we're being proactive about it, uh, whether that's utilities or policymakers or ideally all together, we'd start thinking about how do we make the current grid more useful in the new world and what investments need to be made and what things need to be just written off. You know, I'd say coal is probably an example of, I'm not sure I see any useful, it's too expensive. And environmentally, it's nasty. You know, it's just, it's, that's, that'll be an example of, I think that's a stranded asset no matter what. No, no, I, nuclear? Yes, go ahead, please. Well, I was just going to say, nuclear maybe isn't a stranded asset, but what role does that play? It's not an asset that's supposed to go up and down. It's a baseload asset. So what's the role of nuclear? Um, gas plants? I mean, you can go down the whole list, but I think that, uh, the, the, uh, the most simple way of looking at it, which is kind of how I look at it is, I think it's fairly obvious what direction we're headed. I think it's fairly obvious that whether it's three years from now or five years from now or 10 years from now, consumers are gonna be completely free to be completely independent of the grid. So do you wait for that to happen and then deal with 
a grid that nobody wants, or do you work today on making that grid? Any way you want to look at it, I think, yes, there is going to be a very high cost nationally to changing this grid from what it is to what it needs to be. But I think the least possible cost will be incurred by being the most proactive and the highest cost will be incurred if you just act like nothing's happening, let all these consumers leave. And then after they've already left, try to can try to, I don't know, do whatever you can with the grid and try to draw them back in. Um, and I think the only thing that could stop what I'm talking about would be outlawing people from disconnecting from the grid, which probably isn't going to happen in the United States. I, I hear your point on that. And I, I see what the trend that you're talking about, that consumers are going to drive this whole uh, decentralization and uh, diversification of the energy sources and the uh, energy grid. But at the same time, energy infrastructure provides these, you know, fuel and electricity to nations, industries and uh, Everything, you know, depends on the electricity, like irrespective of whether we are talking about transportation system or communication system or, you know, government infrastructure, everything depends on the electricity. Now, to ensure a resilient nation, we need to make sure that all these different pieces uh, that are, you know, necessary for providing that electricity to each and every industry, each and every sector, each and every entity across nations, is government, industries, organizations, academia, that we have the whole infrastructure in place. I mean, while we are moving towards the modernization, we are developing smart grids, we are developing uh, microgrids, we are solving uh, and we are, you know, uh, having diversification in the sources, we are solving many problems, but we are also increasing many problems, like, you know, in briefly we talked about, you know, because we have a bigger exposure of, you know, the vulnerabilities where uh, any hacker, any terrorist, any rogue nation state can, you know, target us and electromagnetic pulses, you know, even small, you know, electromagnetic uh, pulse equipment can create a damage. So when we want to ensure the reliability, resiliency of a community, of a city or a nation, uh, to make sure that there is continuity of the, you know, uh, electricity or power, then how are we, what kind of efforts would be necessary? Because now we have, we cannot just make those changes in one place because it's no longer going to be centralized. It's going to be decentralized. So there will need to be changes in so many different, you know, places at the same time. And it creates so much more complexities. No doubt about it. You know, I, look, electricity, there's a direct correlation between uh, access to affordable and reliable electricity and prosperity. If you look uh, at any country, anywhere in the world, you can look at what access people have to electricity, what's the cost of it, and there's that direct correlation. It just, it, it brings prosperity in the same way that uh, absence of electricity or unaffordable electricity uh, simply limits what you can do economically. It just it just does. So uh, it's one of the most important commodities that exists. And everything that you said is true. And it's the reason I'd say we have to, as a country, bring forward this discussion about the changes that are occurring. Uh, we have to talk about the grid we have and we have to start figuring out how to deal with it because I think that all these things have to happen at the same time. The grid is going to become more decentralized and it could conceivably become completely decentralized where utilities don't even exist and they're just, it's a group of consumers that have their own electricity. But what can happen, I believe, and what should happen is that we don't just write off the grid that we have, but we deal with the issues that it's facing. So there's this issue of, well, consumers are becoming more independent. So how do we turn ourselves into more of a service provider to them that they really want rather than thinking that they're captive to us when they're simply not going to be captive to us? The other thing is, how do we deal with the physical vulnerability of the traditional grid? And that's you know a problem that's been around forever but i think it's a problem that has to be addressed if we're going to have this large grid 
then how do we better protect it from its you know, most obvious vulnerabilities? I think that requires investment and it requires everyone recognizing where the points of vulnerability are and how can we protect them? And then last but not least, whatever this grid is, uh, it is going to become much more digitized it's going to become much smarter. If it's not, then it, it's definitely going to be a complete write-off. So it will become smarter. Uh, it will become interconnected. And that is, again, a point of vulnerability. Um, it probably will become the greatest point of vulnerability for this centralized grid. And that's sort of back to, I guess, where we started. Is uh, these, are, these are things that if the grid is going to survive as a as a as a service it's going to have to go through these i think uh, physical protections cyber protections and people that operate it are going to have to go through this transformation as well of seeing themselves as service providers that have to compete for the business of consumers because the alternative will always be i think in the near future simply not participating yes Yes, I mean, the whole uh, the ecosystem is changing. And when uh, when we are moving away from centralization and few players, you know, taking decisions uh, about how things should be towards, you know, many you know, peop uh, people or uh, players taking decision. And we, when we are moving towards decentralization, it's a whole new kind of uh, complex set of challenges emerging because designing a grid with the right infrastructure it's not like you know it's going to be challenging now it has always been challenging and investments uh, in this new generation of new facilities new ecosystem new microgrids or new smart grids what kind of smart grids we want what kind of smart meters we want what kind of uh, interconnectivity it has. so there are so many different variables that coming come into play so are we as a nation optimizing these investments by making them in a deliberate or rational fashion or uh, are they currently being driven by many different players each responding to their own you know needs and necessities and imperatives that they conflict with others making related investments so are do we know where we are going because there are so many it, to me it seems like there are so many players involved and so many different directions we are moving so to be able to take a national look, you know, or how a nation should move forward and how a nation should become resilient or, you know, come up with the different security measures. I think it, it looks like, you know, it's getting more and more complex as we move towards this uh, technology trigger transformation. Well, we are definitely not as a nation or a group of states dealing with this issue in a as if we had a mission, which was to deal with the grid as exists today and the grid as we want it to be in the future. And how do we get there? You know, what, what assets are going to be stranded and who's bearing the cost of those and what investments do need to be made? We just factually are not doing that. What you see is that happening in individual states, dealing with it individually uh, with different approaches. And I would say, if you believe what we've been talking about, which is that we're going to see one of the most fundamental transformations ever in the energy industry and in the electricity industry, a radical reshaping of how people generate and consume and manage electricity that puts the entire existing grid at risk in the sense of might even not be needed anymore. To me, that elevates it to a national problem. Um, you know, if, if our infrastructure becomes a one big obsolete mess, that materially impairs our economy. It's an, it's an incredible write-off, obviously. In the same way that if other countries that we might consider economic competitors of ours are approaching electricity in a thoughtful, strategic way nationally to make sure that their electricity is secure and least cost, then we're going to be at a very major competitive advantage. So I hope, and there's certainly people advocating it, that this will become elevated to what it, I think should be, which is we're looking at a national crisis in electricity 
I think that it is naive to just say, well, uh, you know, different people doing different things in different states, hopefully will all work out. I think that that's highly unlikely. I think that it's more likely that it's going to play out okay in one place and terrible in another. And it's just not good for the country, especially when these grids are in most cases physically connected. So it's, you know, problems in one place can impact others. That's why um, it, re it, it really does need this elevation to a, a national policy, even though, of course, these are state responsibilities, but it needs a national coordination. And I think a recognition at the national policy level that this is one of the biggest things, if not the biggest things happening out there right now. And it needs that kind of attention. Not saying it needs federal laws, but I think it needs federal action to organize everyone and to say, look, let's, let's try to get a consensus here on what it is we have today. What are we looking at? Especially in a case where I don't think there's going to be real disagreement over the changes that we're looking at. There's not going to be real disagreement about the um, stranded asset problem. The disagreement, I think, is going to be around timing, scale, but... Anybody who lives anywhere in this country, I think, recognizes, you know, coal is kind of going out, renewables are coming in. These are just trends that they're not going to change because it's not like all of a sudden coal is going to get cheaper or solar is going to get more expensive. These are just, this is the way it's going. And I think it's doable to build a consensus, and I hope it's doable, to then take action so that we're not in the situation we talked about of, Nobody really gets their act together until we're at a place where any homeowner just disconnects when they feel like it and they just leave in, in droves because it's simply cheaper. And we failed to make productive use of the grid that we have. Sure. No, I, I I think those are all very valid and fair points. And at the heart of the, all this discussion is the security risks that are emerging because of this interconnectedness and interdependencies. And when we decentralize and when we diversify and when it is digitized, our smart meters and you know our smart grids, there is so many security risks emerges. And then you know if we, who is responsible for those? Who is going to yep. be accountable for managing those security risks and that's where you know the big problem is so, uh, as we will as a nation like you said we will have to come up with a consensus we'll have to come up with a structure that brings accountability it is not a problem you know to decentralize it's a good thing to decentralize but at the same time we do need to come up with the effective risk management structure who is how are we going to manage the security risk when we decentralize how are we going to manage the security risk when we digitize our grids and when we have the smart meters and when everything is, uh, the, when the internet, information communication technology, there is two-way communication going everywhere. Who is going to be responsible? Who is making sure that we are resilient? So as we, you know, there is a lot of opportunity in this decentralization in uh, making sure that you know we go towards this modernization of the grids there are a lot of opportunities by the same time there are many many security risks emerging so this is the last question what are your concluding thoughts on the future of this uh, grid as you see you know nations taking uh, different you know actions strategic actions at local levels national levels and what would you like to tell our curious uh, young you know minds out there you know across nations our global viewers and listeners who wants to get involved in making the grids not only smart but uh, also ready for the coming tomorrow well to younger people i would say this is a once in a lifetime opportunity uh, an opportunity that hasn't occurred in many people's lifetimes a once in a lifetime opportunity to be part of the grid of the future and the energy supply of the future. These changes we've discussed, as I said, these are happening. We're just talking about the pace. And based on the past, you know, what's happened over the last five years, I would be betting on the pace going faster and accelerating as opposed to going slower. So I think we're going through tremendous technological change. It's an area that's attracting tremendous investment. There's tremendous entrepreneurialism and innovation going on in this whole area. And a lot of people are rushing towards what, what I talked about, about enabling 
the independence of every home, of every building to be its own basically power plant and to manage its own electricity. And the idea of them trading amongst each other, these are all ideas that there's literally thousands of startups and energy companies and technology companies that are excited about this as an opportunity and want to be part of the transformation. For older people, I'd say they're, they're more the ones that are responsible for what we have and having to deal with the fact that, yes, it's all exciting that everyone's going to be independent, but what does that mean to what we have and what can we do with what we have? which I'd say is not so much a problem for younger people that I think are better suited to innovating for the future. It's more a case of older people dealing with this infrastructure and being proactive and not letting us like run into a wall where we only deal with it when it's kind of too late to deal with it. And I think it's certainly possible. I hope it happens. And uh, there's every reason in the world to do it when we go back to the subject of, uh, of this, which is it's all under the issue of risk. I don't think there is uh, any uh, higher risk or bigger impact uh, way of hurting a country than disrupting its electricity supply. Uh, whether we're talking about doing it at a national scale or doing it in a city, if you want to basically freeze and put in peril any community, take away its electricity supply. Uh, even in a real, relatively short period of time, if, if electricity is interrupted, uh, there are terrible things that happen. Uh, it's extremely difficult to you know, run your normal life, and then you get into spoilage or unavailability of food or unavailability of water. Things just go bad really quick when it comes to the electricity system not working. So there's really, in my mind, there's nothing I can think of more important in the world of risk than protecting our grid and making sure people get electricity. And in the context of things aren't the way they used to be, and this grid has to change, uh, the fact that it's our number one security vulnerability, that has to get the attention of people, and we have to deal with it. Very true, very true. So thank you so much, Michael, for participating in Risk Roundup today. We appreciate your thoughtful insight on Smart Grid and our global viewers and listeners would benefit tremendously from what you had to say. And even if just a single person, single individual can come up with an idea or even understand the complex challenges facing grid today, this Risk Roundup Dialogue has been of service and we thank you for that. My pleasure. Thank you. So Risk Roundup, a global initiative launched by Risk Group, is a security risk reporting for risk emerging from existing and emerging technologies, technology convergence and transformation happening across cyberspace, geospace and space. We at Risk Group believe that risk management, security and peace, they walk together hand in hand. Though security is related to management of threats and peace to the management of conflict, risk management is related to management of security vulnerabilities as well as management of conflict. And it is not possible to conceive any one of the three without the existence of the other two. All three concepts feed into each other. We believe that the security we build for ourselves is precarious and uncertain until it is secure for everyone across nations. Tradition becomes our security. So if we build a culture of managing risk effectively, it will lead us to security and security will lead us to peace. Let's manage the existing and emerging risks together for more information on the risk roundups, to watch the risk roundup videos or hear the risk roundup podcast, please go to riskgroupllc.com and do not forget to subscribe and share. Until next time, I'm Jayashree, host of Risk Roundups, signing off. See you next time. Thank you.